logical spiritual life of our party. Uh, so to uh, that end, we're gonna start uh, this evening with a brief overview of the program and its main propositions. And tomorrow morning, uh, we start at 10 a.m. and we will discuss how the program charts the road to socialism, how we get from where we are today to where we wanna be. Concepts like the United Front and the Popular Front uh, and the anti-monopoly strategy leading up to working class power and social revolution. Then we're gonna break, uh, take a little pause for the cause, have lunch. Uh, and in the afternoon, uh, we're gonna have a panel discussion on the program and the working class um, and its relationship to current struggles and issues. We have, in good, we, have good fortune, we have the good fortune to have a, a number of young and old uh, wonderful trade union activists who are gonna uh, have a conversation about the program. Um, and then we're gonna break and, and there's gonna be a potluck, uh, a dinner, uh, and we'll announce the location uh, later. That's gonna start at what, 5.30 or so, something like that. Um, and so we're looking very forward to that. And then we will conclude on Sunday with a conversation on the fight for unity um, against sexism, racism, and homo homophobia. And that's a really important conversation. You know, not just with respect to the main political issues and ideological issues that are at, at stake, but also in terms of how we relate to each other, you know, how we conduct ourselves, our uh, comradely, um, brotherly, sisterly, siblingly, siblingly, is that a word? Uh, interactions, you know? Uh, because many times in the party, we have a situation where we have too few women. We have a situation in which, uh, you know, we have a majority of, of uh, men. And uh, situations are, arise where some of us don't listen. Some of us speak in tones that are, are inappropriate. Some of us allow others to do all of the work and we sit around and uh, give advice, you know? All of those kinds of things happen and the, the same up, obtains with respect to people of color. Um, and sometimes there are unconscious influences that, that, that have a, a negative impact. Uh, and then we also have the situation where we have um, a lot of young people coming into the party. In fact, we've recruited about 8,000 young people over the last uh, two years. Um, and that cohort is very energetic and very active and, and wanna learn. And, and uh, some of our older comrades have taken them under their wing and, and provided tutelage. And, and uh, um, there's another word I'm looking for. Um, companionship and uh, uh, there's still a third word I'm looking for that won't uh, uh, come to me. What do you call it when? Mentorship, mentorship. mentorship. Um, but those relationships are very important and we have to be really careful about how we conduct ourselves as communists, you know? So that we don't and even inadvertently give the wrong impression, you know, because sometimes, uh, or overtly, you know, that you're hitting on somebody and that kind of thing. And you can ruin um, relationships that way and uh, set comrades back sometimes for, for life. And so we're gonna be dealing with all of the dimensions of that issue, hopefully during, during that, uh, during that uh, uh, class. Um, we're gonna break for a half hour. And then we're going to uh, participate in a memorial for the late uh, Betty Smith. 
Betty Smith was from Minnesota. I believe she was from the Iron Range. And she was one of the district organizers of the party here in Minneapolis. Um, and she later moved to New York and uh, joined the National Committee of the Party and became the leading figure at International Publishers. And she kept that uh, publishing house alive for a couple of decades, you know. Every day, Betty came into work. Uh, and I was very moved by it because she had a disability, you know, and that disability did not get in her way. I can still see her walking down and getting off the bus on 6th Avenue and walking down 23rd Street to the uh, uh, building. So there's going to be a memorial for Betty at uh, 1 o'clock, uh, well, it would be 12 Central on uh, Sunday. So, um, that's what we're going to deal with. Any questions about the uh, program for the uh, next couple of days? No? Okay. So let's get started. Our party's program was adopted at the last convention. When was that? 2018, 2019? And it is the latest incarnation uh, of a long tradition in our movement that was begun first by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, uh, who wrote what was probably the first communist program, um, the manifesto of the Communist Party, Communist Manifesto. I think next year is going to be the 150th anniversary of the manifesto. 150 years. And so we should begin to think in Minneapolis, what are we going to do to celebrate um, that event, you know, and, and, and who can we join in with to, to make that happen? Um, uh, that's something for the club and the uh, district uh, to uh, think about. Everybody here, I imagine, has read the manifesto, right? <laughs> at least once in your uh, life. Does anybody remember the first time that you read the manifesto? Sarah, you, you remember? Um, um, I do. I remember it very clearly. You know, my mom, bless her heart, gave me a copy of the uh, manifesto. Um, and I can, I can see it clearly. I must have been 12 or 13 years old. It was, it was after uh, Martin was murdered uh, in Memphis while supporting the strike of the uh, sanitation workers, you know? And uh, there was a rebellion in my city. Like there were rebellions in I think 112 or 113 cities were, across the country and I recall that uh, they sent in the National Guard and uh, there were tanks and armored carriers in the playground where we went to school, right in the next block in the backyard. And we were sitting there, uh, my friends came and got me, we, we walked over and we were sitting there playing on the tanks and my older brother Carl, uh, may he rest in peace, came over and he snatched my behind off the tank and he told me to go home. And I went home and he showed me a picture of a young Vietnamese girl who was burned by napalm, you know? And she was running down the street half naked, third degree burns on her body. And he said to me, he said, these are the same people who did this to that little girl, you know? And that experience uh, of being occupied by the uh, National Guard and, and my brother, you know, um, uh, giving me a life lesson, you know, it, it helped radicalize me. And of course, there were a lot of other things going on at that time, you know, there was the, uh, uh, 
Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee in the Civil Rights Revolution, the Black Power Movement, you know. They were the Young Lords and, and uh, the Black Panther Party and SDS. And, and we admired the Black Panthers very much, you know. Uh, we were all uh, Black Panthers at least spiritually, you know? And it may have been that, that my mother, I, I, I may have said to my mother that I wanted to join the Panthers. Uh, and I think that her response was to give me a copy of the manifesto. And I went downstairs to the basement where I slept, you know, and I remember reading the opening lines of the manifesto. Um, the history of hitherto societies is the history of what? Class struggle. What are some of the, like, the main propositions of the uh, our manifesto? History of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. Class struggle is the motive force of history, right? That's one of the basic propositions of historical materialism. What else did we gain from the main proposition of the manifesto? Somebody help me out. Please. Unionization of, of, of working parties, the, the, the um, necessity of workers coming together to combine, to organize in the face of capitalist exploitation, right? Very, very clear. What else? And, and, and what did Marx say about the working class in the manifesto? Workers of the world unite. Of the world unite but you're a little too early. That comes next. Oh, Before wow. that, he said what? He said of all the classes standing face to face with the modern bourgeoisie, the working class, is the really revolutionary class. Remember that? The working class is, is the really revolutionary class. And then they, they, they end the manifesto uh, with workers of the world uh, unite. You ain't got nothing to lose but your chains. You got a world to win, right? And then, and then Lenin in his Genius added to it, didn't he? Lenin said, workers and oppressed peoples of the world unite. You've got nothing to look. And, and many people don't realize it, but when Lenin did that, he added something to the a formula, didn't he? What did he add when, 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 when he added workers and oppressed people, when he added oppressed people to the formula, what was he saying? He was adding to the uh, centrality of the class struggle, the struggle for democracy. Because he was talking about the oppressed people's right to self-determination, you know? And that's a basic democratic right. Um, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. The manifesto and our party's program have a lot of similarities. Both are an elaboration of our general views and beliefs. Both serve as a roadmap or a guide to get where we want to go. And both are based on a scientific world outlook, right? A materialist conception of the real world. Not the world as we want it to be, but the world as it actually is. 
Um, and both are products of collective processes. The first draft of the manifesto was written by Engels. In fact, uh, for an organization called the League of the Just, the League of the Just, who soon after changed their name to the Communist League. And they asked Fred Engels to write the first draft and he wrote it and they rejected it. And they asked him to write another one and they rejected that. They said, no, nah, this is too academic, Fred. We need a declaration. And so then Fred Engels called his homie Karl Marx and he said, look, man, I need some help on it. I done wrote this damn thing two or three times. Can you, can you give me an assist? And he and Marx got together and they um, wrote the manifesto and it was published in um, final form in 1848, 1848. Um, so, so there was some kind of collective process that uh, uh, back and forth that went on between them. I don't know if that document was ever voted on. Uh, but they did get some feedback. Our program also is very much the product of a collective process. A collective wrote it. Um, it was submitted to the leading collectives of the party for discussion, right? National board discussed it in draft form. National committee discussed it in draft form. We held four, I think, national meetings where there was discussions uh, about different aspects of the program. Then it was submitted to the clubs and districts for discussion. There were written contributions. You know, we agree with this. We uh, don't agree with that. All part of our pre-convention discussion process. And then, it's debated at the convention, and if we agree on it, voted on, right? The convention votes it up and down, up or down. And, and if there's a high level of unity on the program, it's easily voted up. But if not, it stays in draft form. I was reading a piece by Gus the other day, written in 1968. Um, entering the debate on the party pro. And I was surprised to find out that that program had been in draft form for eight years. It was submitted to a convention and then it was rejected. Well, maybe not, maybe rejected is too strong a word. It was tabled for further discussion and they continued to debate until they got to the point where they were able to uh, develop a consensus. And once the program is voted on, it becomes a binding document, right? With all of the force uh, and, and uh, a strength that emerged from the thousands of contributions that went into shaping it in its final form. And what the convention votes on and brings together, let no person tear asunder. That doesn't mean that every letter or comma or period um, uh, or formulation has to be adhered to, but it does mean that this is our official document, right? And if you wanna change it, you have to do so according to the same processes with which it was adopted. In other words, it has to go through the leading collectives. You can't come into the party and say, I like the party, but I hate the program and I'm going to change it. Um, in fact, the program says at the beginning, at the end of the introduction, if you like this program and you agree with it, we invite you to join. 
But if you don't like it, you know, any questions about the process of adopting the party program? No? Clear? Peter? Possibly, it kind of depends on the um, degree of shelf life that the convention has, you know? And the degree of shelf life kind of depends on what happens in the country, you know? So if there's a dramatic change in um, the political balance of forces, uh, then that would might require a change in the uh, uh, program. Uh, we may have to make a major tactical or strategic shift, in, in, in which case, then we would have to do it. But if things kind of stay the same, you know, and there aren't major changes, like for example, from uh, the year 1998 through 2007, there was a period of uh, uh, economic uh, boom, remember, which was broken up by the Great Recession that was precipitated by the subprime crisis. So if, and things kind of more or less stayed the same. I mean, Bush got elected and uh, started the Iraq war and, and uh, uh, you know, the Democrats won the House, the Republicans won the Senate, or the Repub or vice versa. That wouldn't require no change in the program. But when the recession hit and all those banks collapsed and Black folk and Latinos and senior citizens suffered the greatest wealth loss in history, and then the Tea Party was born, and then Occupy Wall Street, that we, we might re have required, we might have said, no, we need to take something fundamentally different has happened. A new economic era is upon us and therefore we would need to write a new program. So it kind of depends on what happens in the uh, country, any, any, any other kind of, or in the world, you know, Mark? Not only do the National Board, National Committee discuss the platform, but also so does districts and clubs and individuals, because I believe it's a four month period that all issues in the Communist Party are put into the discussion and so forth for the upcoming convention. And I have always thought that that is really, you know, really a good sense of democratic centralism and how our party works to get as many voices to c come out and speak about what we think is important in our platform that like you said will govern us for the next four to five years and i i think that's one thing that's very unique about our party and the other thing that i love about being in the communist party is that our platform isn't like in a bourgeois sense <laughs> you pass all kinds of stuff and you don't do nothing right you know in our party our document on the party platform is viewed as a very serious document that we need to work with and support hey, anyone else yeah i so so uh, and we should look online to see if anybody, you know, has questions or, or, or comments there. So the program, Marcus Wright, is the product of a very democratic discussion. You know, it takes place in the board, in the national committee, but most importantly in the clubs and districts. And there's verbal conversation and there's written conversations and then there are changes and edits. And then finally it's adopted uh, 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 by the uh, convention. 
So our program has four main themes. Um, it probably has more, but you know, it's my party and I'm choosing four. Um, class struggle and the working class is one major theme that runs throughout this program. The struggle for democracy, number two. In fact, the program discusses the struggle for democracy at some length. Um, our strategic policy, our strategy for getting to socialism, United Front, People's Front, the anti-monopoly strategy. Number three, third thing. And finally, um, its treatment of the role of the party. What kind of party are we trying to build? And, and, and what do communists do? in our day-to-day -day political work and activity. The program begins with a series of propositions about the uh, basic contradictions under capitalism. The first of which has to do with the very basis of the class struggle. Uh, it has to do with what is at the heart of the class struggle in this country. When you boil it all down to its, its basic essence, what is, the, what is the class struggle all about and where does it take place? Does anybody want to answer that question? What is, what is the class struggle in its very essence? Point of production. At the point of production. At the point of production. And what happens there? and the owner steals. The workers produce and, and, and the bosses, the capitalists take, right? Um, at its very uh, essence, the, the basic struggle under capitalism, which Peter is gonna talk about uh, tomorrow, is over the fight over the division of the workday. Isn't that the case? That, 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 that workers, uh, uh, who gets what? Workers uh, want pay increases, we want pay increases. We want, we want health care, right? We want to slow down production and the bosses want to speed it up. We want break time. We want to be able to go to the bathroom, take a lunch. Um, and uh, the bosses uh, want the opposite. They want to maximize their profit. In fact, they have to maximize their profit. They just can't make any profit. They got to make the highest profit possible. Why? Because they're competing with other capitalists. And if they don't make the highest profit possible, they're likely to be taken over and eaten up by their competition. It's a dog eat dog world, you know? Um, and so, uh, and that was, this is what was at the heart, Mark, um, of the dispute that took place between the railroad workers and the railroad corporations, wasn't it? What was the main issue? Sick leave. Sick, sick leave, you know? And work schedules. And work schedules. They wanted control over their work schedules. They asked for 15 days. How many did they get? None. Why? You know, I was talking to a steel worker the other day, and he said, you know, I negotiated dozens of contracts he was the president of his local in Warren, Ohio, by the way, where I'm from. Well, I'm from Youngstown. That's where Gus led the little steel strike back in the day. He said that the companies would rather give money than days off. Why? Because for every day off, they got to bring somebody else. They got to do a new hire, you know? And so they fight it 
like nobody's business. He said, in my union, in the steel workers union, we, we have three days that we want, three. And, 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 and so if the railroad had gotten seven, that would have been something. But at the heart of the issue was the, the uh, right to strike. And the fact of the matter is that the Biden administration and the Congress abrogated, they were strike breakers. They, 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 they violated the sacred right of the workers to, to, to strike, you know? And that was um, a very negative uh, development. So the most basic struggle under capitalism, what is at the heart of the class struggle is the fight over the division of the workday. Who, who gets what? That is the first proposition of the program. The second proposition is that there are three basic forms of the class struggle. Three. What are they? Do anybody know? Organizing, right? Um, organizing for what? Anybody? For the changes that we need. Well, we already talked about one form of the class struggle, right? Economic, struggle for wages, benefits, health care, sick leave. That's one. Uh, uh, basic part of the class struggle. Organizing for what we need, politics, uh, uh, voting rights, uh, criminal justice, decent housing, decent health care, marriage equality, right? Second part of the uh, class struggle. What's the third part of the class struggle? Anybody know? Lennon said there are three basic forms of the class struggle. Economic, struggle for better living conditions, higher, more money, pension, political. That's the second part. And the third part is the battle of ideas, right? Ideological. What are some examples of the ideological struggle today. Well, you hear a lot about the difference in, um, like, I guess, even like economical ideology, like leftists, people on the right, conservatives, or people like us more on the left, like. Um, I think that when it comes to our position, I think it always seems like it's a uphill battle for us because a lot of the people that have a, a lot of power in this country, they're not communists <laughs> because they want money, you know, and that's, that's something that they prioritize over a lot of things. And I think a lot of the, um, nooks and crannies of class struggle and it's like base sense stem from that and people essentially wanting to prior over prioritizing money to a point where it causes heavy societal ramifications for everyone that doesn't have it if that makes sense the question the question is uh ideological struggle, the huge uh, clash is between the working class idea of what freedom is, right? And the uh, capitalists want to have freedom to exploit, freedom to oppress. And that is gonna create some contradictions in our movement going forward. So freedom for whom? That's a question. Freedom for whom? Capitalists want free trade, right? They define freedom as uh, the uh, free trade. Workers define freedom as the, 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 the right to collectively bargain. That's one big part of uh, 
We have to be, uh, what, what was the bill in the Congress uh, for collective bargaining? What was it called? The, uh, the one before that, the, the, uh, the employee free choice, was it? The, the employee free choice bill. They were smart, they included freedom in the, uh, um, what about critical race theory? Isn't that an important part of the ideological struggle? Uh, you guys, we have some teachers in the house. Isn't, isn't, isn't that part of it? Uh, what about Roe v. Wade and the whether or not a, a woman has uh, the right to control her own body? Um, what about trans rights and the ability of someone to choose their gender? Isn't that a part, an important part of the battle of ideas? What about the epic world historic uh, struggle between capitalism and socialism. You know, isn't that a big part of the battle of ideas? I mean, you know, when when Bernie Sanders ran for the presidency, and he he said that he was a socialist, democratic socialist, and, and he got how many votes? Socialism became a uh, a, a household world word, you know, they, they were talking about it on CNN and on NBC and on, and, and the people on Fox News were going crazy, you know, um, and the battle between these two, capitalism and socialism became a big, big uh, issue. Um, so three uh, basic forms of of the uh, a class struggle, economic, political, and the battle of ideas. Uh, a big word for that is ideological forms of struggle. In the course, in the course um, of this very fierce class struggle, the production process in this country um, has uh, produced a single working class. That's the third important proposition of the program. Um, the first being that the basis of the class struggle is the fight over the working day. Um, the second, that there are three forms of the class struggle, economic, political, ideological. The third is that the uh, class struggle in this country um, has uh, uh, forged a single working class. Not two working classes, not three working classes, but one working class. Why do I raise this issue? If you listen to these news programs, Fox, MSNBC, uh, ABC, you'll hear them talking about the white working class or the black working class or the Latino working class. Are there three working classes in this country? Let me ask another question. How is class determined according to Marxist terms? What is the, how do you determine what class you're in? Does anybody know? In relationship to production, what you do, right? Um, we argue that class is determined in relationship to production, not by income, not by how much you make, not by whether you're employed or unemployed, because unemployed people are workers, most of them, uh, but by whether you are a seller of your ability to work or a buyer of it. If you sell your ability to work, you're a worker. If you buy it, you're a capitalist. 
if you're a big capitalist, you purchase a thousand people's ability to work. If you're a small, uh, small time capitalist, if you're a petty capitalist, you buy two or three or 10 or 20, you know, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the difference. Does everybody agree with that? Not only that, the capitalist of the right uh, forces try to make more than uh, one working class, like you mentioned, by saying white working class and whatnot. <clears throat> but uh, uh, most strangely to, to, to me is that uh, either that or they deny the existence of a working class. I was shocked and I was still shocked coming from outside of the United States that uh, uh, they think by talking about the middle class, they're covering everybody. Mm. <laughs> and then not only that, but the right wants you, whether you're a sanitary worker or a railway worker, to think that you're a middle class. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and what do they do with gig workers? They say they're independent contractors. They're not workers. You're, you're a small businessman, you know? You got it going on. You can, you, you can, you, you can, <coughs> you can grow. And that's what the woman says to the guy. Right? You're an independent contractor. And so um, if, if uh, we agree that uh, class is determined by relationship to production, not by income, not by whether you're employed or unemployed, but by whether you are a seller of your ability to work or a buyer of, if we agree to that, isn't it the case that the vast majority of the people in this country are workers, you know? Um, it's not just people who work in a factory, uh, but teachers are workers, nurses, retail workers, but also doctors, engineers, professors, you know, they just had a 45,000 professor just unionized in California. And a big number of doctors just, just, just unionized in uh, New York. I forget the number, Cameron. Huh? You don't know what it is. Capitalism is driving everybody into the working class. Whether you like it or not, you're being pushed. We call that the process of proletarianization, right? That's what you're being driven down. You're being forced to organize so that you can have a life. However, there is an important qualification to this concept of a single working class. Yes, there's one working class. Um, but it is affected by what we call a racial and gender-based social division of labor. Um, racism and sexism have relegated people in this country to separate, separate and different occupations. When we talk about a racial and gender-based social division of, of labor, we mean that um, uh, capitalism has compelled uh, uh, different categories of people to work in different places. Isn't that true? Go to the hospital. I'm always struck when I go to the, what do you see when you go to the hospital? Who, 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 who is in housekeeping? Black people. Brown people, who does the cooking? Black people, brown people, who does the security? Black people, brown people. You go to the nursing staff, it's a little better there. there are more African-American, Latino, Asian nurses, doctors. As you move up the ladder of the hospital employed doctors, largely, 
white, Asian, administrators, white, owners of the hospital. Do I need to say it? There's a, there's a um, racial and gender-based social division of labor in this country. And that <laughs> brings us to the fourth major proposition of our program. That is that the fight against racism and sexism is a, <clears throat> is a basic requirement to achieve class unity. And, 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 and here the, the program puts forward a very important and very nuanced presentation of the relationship between the class struggle and the struggle for democracy. Yes, capitalism forges a single working class. Yes, it tears down divisions. Yes, it compels people to speak a common language. But at the same time, it forces um, workers to combine and form unions in order to survive. But at the same time, it, it pulls us apart. It pushes us into separate communities, um, redlining. It, it, it makes us bury our dead in separate cemeteries. It compels us to worship in <coughs> separate religious establishments. It, it, it makes us educate our children in separate schools. Um, do you know that the United States today um, is more segregated than it was when in 1954, when Brown versus the Board of Education was debated in the Supreme Court? <laughs> it's true. De jure legal segregation was abolished, but de facto segregation still exists. U.S. capitalism in the course of its development has built up systems of inequality. The racist and sexist division of labor, social, isn't just about work. It's about denying voting rights. Um, it's about denying the right to education. It's about denying the right to equal legal treatment. <coughs> and when we talk about <coughs> rights, aren't we talking about democracy? Isn't it therefore the case that the class struggle in this country is deeply intertwined with the struggle for democracy and equal rights. And that's because the struggle between the two main classes is disfigured by racism and sexism. And the working class, in order to conduct that struggle successfully, has to address this disfigurement. Our party has always argued that the way to address it is to fight tooth and nail against unequal treatment. And you have to do so up front. And you can't compromise on it. During the organization of the mass production industries, people of color had to be admitted to the unions, particularly the craft unions, right? Women have to have the right to vote, period, end of story. Segregation, they sure had to be ended. Um, and most importantly, past discrimination has to be made up for by taking special measures like affirmative action to address it. You know, the Steelworkers Union did a wonderful thing 
back in, when was it, the 70s, when they passed something called the Consent Decree, which opened up jobs to women and Black people in sections of the industry that they had been kept out of for decades. And then the next thing you know what happened? They shut the mills down. But it was a big uh, affirmative action measure which created big opportunities for uh, women and, uh, and uh, people of color. In our history, not everyone on the left has understood this. The Socialist Party, for example, during uh, uh, Debs's time, used to hold the position that, yeah, racism is bad. It's more than bad, it's terrible. But it can't be solved until we have socialism. We have socialism and then we'll address it. To which we answered that with that approach, you'll never get to socialism. Why? Because the class is divided. And the issue keeps coming up over and over again in the initial stages of the Sanders campaign. It came up. They say, you're weak. Why don't you address the problem of Black youth? They kind of sensed that he was weak on it. He, he corrected himself. He did, let's say that. In the debate around the 1619 Project, it keeps coming up. <clears throat> In the debate over critical race theory, even comrades, the use of the term identity politics, you know, and, and they say it like it's a curse word. And somehow when people of color or women or LGBTQ people demand equality, that this is divisive and a concession to, to liberalism. I can't tell you how many times on Facebook, on Twitter, the party gets critics. Why y'all keep talking about identity politics? <coughs> You're making concessions to the Democratic Party. They, they keep saying. But hey, did you forget that one half of the working class are women? Did you not hear, did, did you not get the memo that half the people in this country are gonna be black or brown in 20 years? I mean, wake up, come out that dream world. This brings us <coughs> to the fourth proposition in the program. <coughs> It argues that the class struggle um, and the struggle for democracy, notwithstanding their similarities, are not the same. They're related, but they're different. What is the aim of the class struggle? Does anybody know? What is, what is its purpose from our point of view? Huh? To end it. The aim of the class struggle is to subordinate, the program argues, is to subordinate capital to the will of labor. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to dominate it. We want to dominate capital to overcome it so that we can abolish it. Isn't that what we're trying to do? Huh? We want to expropriate the expropriators. Isn't that the goal? There's a dictatorship of capital with uh, working people. Dictatorship of working people. We want to replace the dictatorship of capital. And by the way, Most workplaces in this country are dictatorships. 
Am I right or wrong? They're dictators. You ain't got no rights. And we want to replace the dictatorship of, 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 uh, of a capital with the rule of the working class. What is the aim of the struggle for democracy, of the democratic struggle? Is it not to advance equality in all forms? Isn't that what we're fighting for? Black equality, Latino equality, LGBTQ equality, um, in all forms. Where do they intersect these two struggles? In the fight for class unity. They're fighting the same enemy, but in order to fight the same enemy where the class is divided by race and gender, in order to unite that class, you have to take up the uh, unique forms of discrimination suffered by people of color and, and women. Because if you don't do that, how can you build unity? You see, isn't that the point? The class struggle and the struggle for democracy intersect in the fight for class unity. Why? Because the democratic struggle brings together the working class and other classes and social forces. It's where alliances and coalitions are built. Isn't that the case? I mean, who supported um, the election of Keith Ellison as attorney general? Who, who, what kind of coalition was created and who led the coalition to elect Keith Ellison as attorney general? Mark? Obviously coming out of labor, I believe that labor was, you know, in a sense, uh, the vanguard of it. But to win, for Keith to win, it needed, you know, all the allies and people to come together because he only won by 20,000 votes. Every, who was always the black community, Hispanic community, the, you know, Asian community, uh, working class people, obviously, union and non-union. And they all came together across the state to make sure that somebody like Keith, who fought for four years as attorney general, fought to protect their rights and their democratic rights as Minnesotans and as Americans and as human beings. That's what he did. And the people of Minnesota understood the importance of Keith Elson. And he uh, was able to win because we put together a united front to win. And everybody played their role and they played it well. I agree that labor, organized labor was in the vanguard, but there were other forces that had to mobilize some votes from the red, what we call red counties, uh, majority uh, Republican uh, vote tallies in these red counties. But the land stewardship project, which one of their big struggles is against corporatized factory farms, putting family farms out of business. We have a we had a network all over the state of Minnesota and we had people uh, monitoring the elections and running elections in some of these red counties. So uh, attorney general is a statewide uh, vote. Uh, Take Action Minnesota, outwardly sort of social democratic formation, but in their <laughs> uh, website, you could find reference to uh, end stage capitalism. So there's change afoot, 
but we mobilized the vote out in some of these red counties because those votes uh, tallied up for a total of that elected Keith. So that was important work. What kind of coalition resulted in her election? Is that, does anybody know? Did, did the, I'm sure the Somali community played a big role. I mean, who else? Did the labor movement play a role? Did the women's movement play a role? Did the peace movement play a role? Um, um, isn't it the case as, 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 as um, demonstrated by Mark and, uh, and uh, Peter that the uh, democratic fight for Black representation in Minnesota was led by the labor movement who built a uh, broad coalition of many different forces um, that got them elected. It, it, it was the democratic struggle that brought together the working class and other class and social forces. That's 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 basically what we're trying to to uh, say. And by that win, that win for the white Keith and Omar, it was an important victory for the working class. And I think sometimes even our friends and sometimes even our members don't under forget or don't understand the importance of victories. Because what it was, a couple things. One, Omar is a new American. She's a woman of color. And she is a new representative of new communities in Minnesota, but also the nation. Keith is also, and they're both Muslim, right? And so they were both attacked heavily. Keith, you know uh, why that it was important. He is the first, you know, statewide elected black person in the history of Minnesota. And the last thing why it's so important is that not only does Keith represent people of color, he represents all people in the People's Coalition to fight for democratic rights, and he just don't say it. He lives it seven days a week, 24 seven. And so that's why that victory of Omar and Keith are so important because we're changing how Americans and Minnesotans look at elections and it's a benefit for the working class. So we agree. That the, uh, struggle for democracy brings together the working class and other class forces. It's where alliances between workers and women and black folk and Latino and Asians and small business and peace forces and religious forces, everybody who has a belief in small d democracy comes together to uh, support candidates, not necessarily on the basis of party label, but on the basis of where do you stand on the issue? Do you support a woman's right to choose? Um, do you uh, support the right of unions to collectively bargain? Uh, are you opposed to uh, the uh, uh, tremendous growth of the military budget? Are you for radical reform of policing? You know? Your hand called for uh, defunding the police. They went after her like nobody's business for that. Uh, uh, the attorney general the same way. Uh, so if you stand for progressive, uh, small d, democratic, uh, working class issues, uh, uh, this is where uh, the class struggle issues and the struggle for democracy come uh, together. And it's on this basis that the program places its fifth proposition. 
that the struggle for democracy is the main vehicle through which class struggle in many forms takes place in this country. Here's what the program says, and I'm quoting, the struggle to defend and enlarge democracy in every realm is therefore the only path to socialism in our country. Any other path will fail and is politically indefensible. Peter, the struggle to defend and enlarge democracy in every realm of life is therefore the only path to socialism in this country. And then they say, any other path will fail and is politically indefensible. That's one hell of a statement. What are the other paths? Somebody tell me. General strike? Somebody wrote to us. We talked about it this morning. Y'all watch Good Morning Revolution? Every Friday we have a YouTube show. We talk about politics. He's on it, I'm on it. Um, Rosanna's on it. They wrote to us and they said, why don't y'all call a general strike? We said, we're not a trade union movement. You want a general strike? Go to the AFL-CIO ask them that question. What, what are the other paths to revolution? People's war? Is that what you're going to do? Another January 6th. Huh? Another January 6th? You, 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 you think that's going to win? What did Mao Zedong say? You want to surround the cities from the countryside in, in this country? When them boys got thermonuclear weapons, that'll blow you from here to kingdom come and back. In fact, there won't even be no kingdom come, you know? Yes, but remember what Mao said, you know, uh, imperialism is a paper tiger. Is a paper tiger, yeah. With nuclear weapons. It's, it's fair to ask, what is your strategy? If you don't like ours, what's yours? Because at least we have a strategy. Huh? That brings us to the sixth proposition in this program. The program champions what we call the United Front strategy. That we see unity of action on issues regardless of political persuasion. We'll work with anybody. If you agree that uh, we should have the PRO Act, we'll work with you. If you agree that women should have a right to choose, we'll work with you. If you agree that uh, global warming is real, we'll work with you. If you believe trans people should have the right to be who they are, we, we don't care if you're a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Christian, a middle, you could be a conservative. We don't care. Let's unite regardless of political outlook and on the, on the issues on which we can agree. Our goal is to work towards a broad coalition led by the working class that has the aim of breaking the grip of the right wing on the political structures of this country, on Congress, on the courts, on the presidency. This coalition, we think, will need to use all of the tools in the toolbox to accomplish its aim. Strikes, boycotts, occupations, voting. It is clear that it will require a radical reform of the political system. Voting in the first place, getting rid of the electoral college, huh? expanding the Supreme Court, statehood for DC, huh? independence for Puerto Rico. We can't be, Puerto, we, can't, we can't have colonies anymore. Am I wrong? Um, 
And, and it will require the creation of a third, what we call anti-monopoly political party led by the labor movement and alliance with women, people of color, LGBTQ people, youth, which all oppressed people, which after defeating the right will work towards electing a anti-monopoly government whose goal will be to free the country of domination by the transnational monopolies. It won't be socialism yet. It won't be social democracy. It will be what we call an advanced people's democracy on the road uh, to uh, socialism and working class power. This we call the anti-monopoly strategy. Any questions about that? We're gonna talk about it in depth tomorrow morning with Scott Hiley. Peter? You, the, well, thinking about Lenin and, and the Bolsheviks, they, they fought for bourgeois democracy in a sense as against czarism and authoritarianism. And, but, Lenin said, uh, bourgeois democracy is a form of the dictatorship of, of, of the capitalist class, even though we would prefer some form of democracy uh, as against fascism or czarism. So th there's this kind of a complex um, dialectic there. I want to uh, suggest that at some point in time in a, a certain kind of crises developed, situation uh, that democracy will have to impose itself. So there's some kind of thrust or, and uh, united will. So we uh, advance to socialism at a point in time when democracy imposes its will. Is there anybody else? I guess uh, one of the... <clears throat> issue that I like to discuss and bring it and have some conversation on is that the idea of workers democracy and cooperatives that I believe with all my bone that our party has made uh, made a great mistake not to get into that kind of line of cooperative in terms of housing for not only member the, the neighborhood, the are you know the ideas of we are we have to start to manufacture food rather than just shoot the you know, and we got to start from there to develop working people, and during that uh, kind of cooperative uh, ventures and so on and so forth. We could uh, we could have conversation about what it's not really yeah you make it easy to understand the Marxism and communism it's not it's easy <laughs> but the idea is to really uh, and another thing is theory and practice you uh, in a practice we got to ha start to have a lot of cooperative ventures cooperative mentality cooperative this co and I. I have been here for 45 years, 50 years. And I have seen the a standard of life of working people from this country, especially when Reagan came and completely the uh, industrialized brought this to a level of third world really right now. And I was at the center of these when the Reagan came. I mean, you know, so you would see that uh, uh, American Hoist had 15,000 people working at union level uh, part. When Reagan came, just just uh, closed the door and drop. Uh, and uh, these are the issue. I want to discuss, you know, I have some conversation about whether uh, really looking at the cooperative as a really part of our strategy. I uh, yeah.
there's a there's a professor, Marxist professor. I think his name is Richard Wolf. He's a big champion of co cooperatives. We support cooperatives. We're not opposed to them. Uh, we don't think it's going to be the main thing, but you know it's part of the picture. Peter, um, all of these struggles, the right to vote, the right to, to uh, choice, um, are all bourgeois democratic rights, all of them. They're not socialist rights. They're good, but they're, they take place within the framework of capitalist democracy. That doesn't mean that they're wrong. And we fight for uh, taking them to their logical conclusion. Take them as far as you possibly can. Embellish them and, 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 and deepen their um, uh, content. Well, we invite anybody online to ask a question. Is there anybody, do we have any questions there? Um, um, to achieve all of, thank you, Michael, to achieve all of this, we have to have a much bigger and stronger Communist Party. And it's starting to happen. As I said earlier, 8,000 people have joined the party in the last two years, 8,000. One third of them paying dues. And, and this leads us to how the party program um, conceptualizes the party and its role. And the program, and this is the seventh proposition for anybody who's keeping track, envisions a mass party, a, a leading party, a militant party that takes initiatives on all fronts. When the working class and people take initiative, we join with it on peace, on strike support, in, in, in fighting police murder. That's great. I'm on y'all's signal. I know that the party leadership in many is always encouraging people to participate in this or that activity. Where were we yesterday, Peter? We were at the Amazon. I wasn't there, but you were there at the at the uh, and Charlie, you were there at the Amazon picket line. And this club, I tell you, is doing some of the best strike support work in the country. At the initiative of Comrade Rebecca, it's true. That's a fact. It's a fact. I'm not just saying it's true. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that we need to, to, to involve everybody in. And when initiative is not taken, we should seize the moment and in concert with others, take initiatives ourselves, you know? In the course of these activities, the program argues that we should have three priorities. Does anybody know what they are? One, to build broad unity right? Unite the class. Unite the class with others. You know, the working class is the really revolutionary class. Marx was right, but we cannot win the fight against capital alone. Why? Because we are fighting the biggest and strongest and most sophisticated and most ruthless ruling class in human history. I don't like Noam Chomsky very much, but he says something I really agree with. He said that the Republican Party is the most dangerous political party in human history. <clears throat> it's true. Them boys are loco. They're dangerous. They're fascist, many of them. 
So we fight for broad unity to, to, to defeat this danger. And in the course, that's the first thing that the, 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 the program called, we build broad unity. Second thing, in the course of building this unity, we fight for working class leadership of it. Fight for the leading role of workers in these coalitions. And in the course of it, we argue for and build uh, class and socialist consciousness. In other words, we fight for what Gus Hall and Henry Winston called the communist plus. Y'all know what the plus is? That's the value added. We keep pointing out over and over again that, that we're gonna win reforms and the ruling class is gonna push it back because that's the nature of capitalism, you know? Unemployment, nature of capitalism, drug addiction, nature of cap racism, sexism, so on and so forth. And, and, but it is through fighting though for those reforms that the working class is trained and learns how to fight. And we constantly point out that the only way we're going to fundamentally solve these problems is by socialism. And, but that in the course of it, we can win important uh, uh, victories, build confidence um, and uh, work towards carrying the struggle uh, to a higher and uh, deeper level. Well, comrades, um, that's my presentation, uh, but let us, Uh, Mark wanted to make a question. Let's see if there are any other comments or questions and then we'll try. See if, let's see if there's anybody online that has a question and then we'll try to wrap up. I was told by the leadership of the party in Minnesota that I only had an hour and a half. If I took another minute, they weren't going to invite me back. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say to a few things is that first off, I really appreciated you clarifying to all the comrades here and on uh, uh, Zoom that there's only one working class. It's not a white working class, black, you know, uh, Hispanic or Asian or whatever, Native American, one working class because our interests, right? And I think another thing is important that we as communists have for a long time been aware that Americans, people, believe tremendously in their democratic rights. And that's why our party came up with, you know, many years ago, is a, a Socialist Bill of Rights, uh, you know, to let Americans know that we believe in democracy from a socialist perspective. I think the other thing is that we have to work on too, is making sure that everybody knows that racism is the, you know, is the nation's most dangerous pollutant. It's, uh, and the working, and the capitalists always try to divide the working class on these issues. And then the last thing I want to just say about why I'm proud to be, you know, a communist, there's a lot of reasons. But uh, I always think that when our car party is at its best, we have ideological clarity. And not that I'm a historian with great knowledge, but when I read uh, the histories of the, you know, Browders and uh, the Sam Webbs and, you know, uh, Jay Lovestones and people like this, the problem has been that our party got off base and our ideological views became muddled and we lost focus on who we are. The Communist Party is the party of the working class. And I think you pointed it out, out so well tonight, Joe. And I thank you for coming to Minnesota. And I appreciate you bringing that heat wave with you. Other time. Questions, points along the way. We're going to be discussing this all weekend. So.
Anybody, any, anybody online to have have a question? Y'all ain't got no question. Don't be shy. So, comrades, um, just to uh, recap, um, we say that there are four main things of our program: class struggles and working class is the first struggle for democracy. Second, um, our strategic outlook is the third, the movement from United, from popular front, United front, anti-monopoly. Um, and then the, 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 the third thing in that program is on the role of the party. And that there are like seven or eight major propositions in this program. Um, one is that the Part of the class struggle is the fight over the division of the working day. We say that there are three main forms of the class struggle, economic, political, ideological, right? Um, we say that in the course of this class struggle, a single working class is forged, you know, um, at the point of production, at the point of production but that this working class has been uh, subjected to, in the course of the growth of capitalism, a racial and gender-based social division of labor. People are forced into certain occupations. And that therefore, the uh, fourth uh, uh, proposition is that in order to address those divisions, sexist and racist, you have to fight for class unity. And that the only way that you can fight for class unity is by working to, is by taking up the special problems that are affecting people of color and women and LGBTQ people. Um, the fourth proposition is that, is that um, the class struggle and the struggle for democracy are not the same, though they are related. And that the aim of the class struggle is to subordinate capital uh, to the will of labor, to dominate it, to overcome it, and to abolish it, to expropriate the expropriators without compensation. Y'all been robbing us for 400 years. Am I right? I mean, come on. And that the aim of the struggle for democracy is to advance equality in all forms, right? Um, and that these two struggles intersect. The democratic struggle brings together the working class and other class and social for It's where you build alliances and you can't win the fight against the, the, the big bourgeoisie unless you have broad alliances and a fighting unity, the working class, uh, the, the, the rule is too strong. It can be defeated, you know, but <laughs> it's gonna take a hell of a fight and a, and, and a hell of a strong and big and sophisticated and mature movement in order to uh, do so. Um, and the fifth proposition, is that the struggle for democracy is the main vehicle through which the class struggle takes place. Again, the struggle to defend and enlarge democracy in every realm is therefore the only path to socialism in our country. Any other path we say will fail and is politically indefensible. which brings us to the last two propositions. We have a strategy, United Front. United Front and more United Front, you know? Unity of action based on issues. Um, and lastly, in order to achieve all of this, we need a bigger, better, more diverse, more active communist party led by workers, led by women, led by people of color, 
The tax initiative, huh? In Minnesota, in Minnesota and the nation, the tax initiative on uh, all fronts. Um, and in the course of that, the role of the party is to build unity, is to fight for working class leadership. And in the course of that, build class and socialist consciousness. That is our plus. Thank you for listening and good night. And we'll see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you.